Because in the bridge, uh, I have a beer suddenly, so everyone else. <laughs> this one too. Um, so this is going to be a, a somewhat strange talk, maybe. Uh, so first of all, the most advanced piece of mathematics I'm going to use the entire evening is that a matrix has a kernel if and only if its determinant is zero. And, but along the way, well, at least by the end, we'll be talking about the hard group subfactor. Uh, with, with no more no more involved than just that. Um, it's also uh, it's essentially joint work with uh, with Noah and Emily. This is some stuff that we started thinking about three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago at the Bodega Bay workshop. Although Noah has been thinking about this sort of stuff for a long time, and uh, all of the good ideas are because Noah has been thinking about it for a very long time. Okay, um, so the the title that I had thought to use was Trivalent Categories. But given that I'm not even going to mention a category in the whole talk, it's sort of a silly title. So let's, uh, let's consider functions. They want to hear about the uh, uh, taking, uh, taking plated trivalent graphs to say uh, the complex numbers. And uh, to make life a little bit easier, Let's only study ones that are that are multiplicative in a certain sense. So first of all, if you have a finite trivalent graph, it's just a discrete union of two pieces. Let's just say that it's uh, oops, the product of the values on the two pieces. Uh, if you've got two pieces that are connected by a single bar, well, let's just say that one's zero. I agree that's somewhat artificial thing to do. If you've got two pieces connected by two strings, let's say it's almost just the product of two pieces closed off, but to make things sensible, we should normalize by just uh, dividing the value of the loop. And one more condition, and we're off and running. This is also just depending on the, oops, sorry, the values of, uh, of x and y sort of closed off in the obvious way. And again, you need to stick in some factor here. OK, so the, the claim is that if you just start thinking about these and, um, and then write a talk about it, uh, at the end of an hour's talk, you've discovered how. Uh, just doing the, most, the, the simplest things along the way. Okay, so to understand functions like this, let's have vector spaces, uh, p sub n, and of course everyone in the audience knows what a planar algebra is, and of course these are simply planar algebras, but we don't really have to say that. So these are just diagrams, which always means planar trivalent graphs, but I mean uh, drawn into disks, so possibly with boundary, with uh, n boundary points. But then we quotient out everything this function can't see. So we quotient out all x's such that uh, if you take that x and pair it with anything at all, the same number of boundary points, the function evaluates to zero. That's, that's a zero and not a. And that's a zero, thank you. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 it's a very helpful yeah. convention of this subject is to write the word zero. And there's nothing magic about four, four connectors, right? No, yes, yeah, so we stopped demanding that it's multiplicative at this point. What I'm saying is four it's zero. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is really for n, yeah. So this is a, this is a diagram with n boundary points in this case. One, two, three, finish. Yep, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, so these hypotheses over here, I just, if you think about it, that uh, the dimension of P0 is 1, the dimension of P1 is 1. Sorry, so the dimension of P1 is zero. zero. The dimension of P2 is one. And the dimension of P3 is also one. Um, it's worth thinking through why that follows from that. Okay, so essentially what we're going to do is start trying to uh, study functions of this form where the next couple of dimensions after this set are pretty small. And for various values that are pretty small, we'll get various different theorems. And at the right point, interesting things will start to fall out of the classification. OK, so let's 
so uh, let's define uh, D and K here to just be the set of, uh, of graphs with n boundary points. Uh, no faces uh, smaller than squares. So no uh, no bygones or, or triangles and, and no loops anywhere in the graph. Uh, and at most k internal faces. Oh. The smallest examples of these. D40 has uh, those four elements in it. Do I have a yes? What about the square? Uh, so the square has uh, has an internal face. It doesn't sit in D four zero. So we just the K is just filtering by the number of faces. Uh, so yeah, exactly next. D four one is everything in D four zero, along with this one thing, the square. D four two. Two extra things, the two ways to actually squares. Okay. And uh, this case with four boundary points is a little bit unusual uh, in that we only saw faces that were squares, but obviously, as soon as you got to say D51, there's pentagons, and you get all, all, all larger faces as you go. Okay, let's just make another definition. Uh, M in K uh, to be the matrix of inner products. Corresponding set D and K. If you take a pair of graphs in one of your sets, you can group them together on, a, on two disks of a sphere. You get some closed five element graph, and your function gives you a number on it. And so that's that matrix. And so let's just compute one of these matrices. See what we're doing. Let's just do M40. So we just need 16 entries computed by uh, taking all the pairs of those guys. I guess, unfortunately, I'm going to write them in a different order than I wrote them over there. I guess. I think of those two as coming first, and then those two. Uh, the top left entry is two circles, and it's a single circle. Theta, dumbbell. Sensible. Uh, something to just point out at this point that although this matrix you can see is, uh, is symmetric, uh, it's not generally necessarily true that it's symmetric because uh, there are chiral polyhedra out there. You'll, you'll so the matrix is F. F yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to drop F from now on. Just, uh, so F is fixed, or yeah. Well, so we're, we're trying to study all of the possible Fs, satisfying those constraints, and we're going to try and classify very. Yes, with various additional hypotheses on it. So you could, could you make it symmetric by taking a mirror image of the... Um, yeah, I guess you could actually. Um, yeah, maybe the right answer is actually that uh, we're not going to get far enough that it matters. <laughs> um, we, we, we will have discovered Hagra or something closely related to Hagra before we meet any Cairo. Okay, so let's... Um, let's uh, Make life a little bit easier. We'll introduce some letters. So let's add D, of course, for the value of the loop. And uh, let's add B for the ratio of the theta and the loop. And, uh, and T for the ratio of the tetrahedron and the theta. And if you work out uh, what's going on, this is just equivalent to saying uh, that if you see a blank one anywhere, that's just B times a straight line. Whoa! see a, uh, a triangle somewhere inside a graph that's always just t times uh, uh, trivalent vertex. 
And of course, uh, to obtain these, we're just using that multiplicative condition for two points and three points. Okay, so with that, uh, in four zero, we can write a little bit more compactly. Sorry, Scott, is there yeah. an obvious example of such a function? Uh, like, should I have one in mind? Mm, well, uh, if you, um, I mean, yes, but I'd have to say the word category. Um, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, um, Even part of temporally leave is a pretty state basis. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so SO3. So take the, think of the strings as being the, the standard representation of SO3 and the fragment vertex being the, the natural map and three copies of that to the trivial. And then you can read any of these diagrams as a map from the trivial to the trivial representation of SO3. The zero works. Zero works pretty well, yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, something that I didn't say at the beginning was that yeah, I wanted yeah. that to be, uh, yeah, well, anyway. The, the, the zero function is obviously. <laughs> no, no, you didn't need this portion. Oh, I divided by it, so I implicitly said that we weren't going to. Okay. Uh, and from now on, uh, notice that you can always, given one of these functions, just scale it by uh, a function that just counts the number of vertices in the, in the graph, okay? And so uh, that means we can actually, by rescaling the function, we can actually always pick t to equal 1, okay? When we rescale, if we, pick, if we make b equal to 1, t becomes t divided by that old value of b, but uh, d doesn't change. So let's, uh, let's just do that from now on so I don't have to write b as much. Normalize it. Okay, so there's one of our matrices and from which there'd be determinants. So let's define uh, delta nk just to be the determinant of that corresponding matrix. M in k and uh, at this point I'm just going to start writing down real polynomials as determinants, uh, and this is kind of the fun of this little project, which is that you get the computer to uh, calculate all these determinants for you, even after you start doing rather large ones. And uh, somehow, all of the hard work gets done by the computer calculating determinants. And after that, you get to read off pretty easily, easy consequences. Okay, so that was just the determinant of that matrix. I think we should be able to do it by hand. That one, you <laughs> ought to be able to do by hand. I admit to not having done it by hand. Uh, okay. <laughs> Younger generation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, later we have sort of 100 by 100 ones where the entries are bigger poly deeper, and it's nice to have them. Okay, so now uh, just something to observe at this point is that uh, if this vector space P3 had dimension at most 3, uh, certainly uh, delta 4, 0 is 0 because it's the determinant of, of the inner products of four elements in a three, three dimensional space. Uh, but the converse isn't true. Uh, because, uh, well, there are more elements in, uh, in D41, D42, and so on. And even though uh, looking at an element of D40, it might pair with all other elements of D40 and give zero, you higher elements might, might detect it and see that it's not zero. So, now, a really strange thing is that I basically went through all the little calculations I'm now going to talk about. Um, thinking that this converse was true, and you draw all the same conclusions and never actually, in fact, is make a mistake, which is kind of strange. Um, <laughs> I love to make it symmetric. Well, yeah, but we've got we've got no guarantees that sort of this function is positive that when you like pair. Yeah, yeah. There's no reason that we, we don't want to look at positive. Have to realize. Yeah. Hopefully, we end up. Every example turns out to be positive. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Uh, okay, but even though there isn't that converse, uh, it turns out that when, as you're getting started, looking in the small cases, like n equals 4 and n equals 5 and so on, you actually come very, very close to having a converse. And this, this is kind of surprising. Um, so here's the sort of uh, the, the amazing lemma for n equals 4 is that uh, uh, d4, 0 is either linearly independent uh, 
or span p4. And this feels like a, a ridiculous sort of result. Like, why do you, you never prove that something is either linear in a unit or span in but, but here you do, which is kind of fun. Okay, so here's a, uh, a brief moment of the talk, which is not computer assisted. Um, so a relation amongst the diagrams in D40 uh, must be of the form alpha times uh, an i plus or minus an h plus beta times this guy plus or minus this guy. So what's going on here? How do we get something like this? Well, uh, the, the, the space of relations we have here, um, well, how to say it? Um, so rotation, rotating by 90 degrees, acts on this space of, of relations here. If you've got some relation, you can rotate it by 90 degrees, and it's still a relation. Okay? Uh, and so all that we're doing is taking that space of relations. Oh, and certainly, because d40 is fixed by the pi rotation, because the diagram is individually fixed, uh, we um, we can just look at the the eigenvalue. The, we can look in the space of relations and look at the eigenvectors for 90 degree rotation, and that's how we get the fact that these coefficients for this diagram, this diagram, are the same up for sine. Okay. Now, if you've got a relation of that form, this suffices to uh, to rewrite. Um, anything in D4 infinity, just an arbitrary trivalent diagram with four boundary points, uh, into D4 zero. Okay, which is which is which is the claim that it spans. So what's going on here? Uh, imagine that you're in the case where alpha is non-zero in order to, to handle things first. Then uh, basically what we're saying is you can take any any i here and turn it into an h at the expense of maybe some lower order terms which we've already dealt with inductively on the number of vertices. Now using that, <clears throat> you can uh, reduce the size of the largest internal face appearing in the diagram. Look at some largest face and just apply this to one of its edges and make it a little bit smaller. Okay, so now inducting on the sizes of faces and so on, you get to simplify everything down to stuff that just has no internal faces whatsoever. Okay, and then in the other case where alpha is zero and you can set a relation like that, it's actually even easier to rewrite it you have complete freedom to reconnect all the strings. Okay, so that's the limit. Uh, easy enough. Uh, so here's the theorem, which gives us that partial converse over there, at least for n equals 4. So following our equivalent, um, dim p4 is less than or equal to 3, delta 4, 0 equals 0, and that we need uh, here also D40 spans P4. It's uh, important. D plus D minus DT minus 2 equals 0. And that same condition. This polynomial here, if you look over there, is just one of those factors of delta 4, 0. And here we'll break out of our pretense that we're not talking about planar algebras or tensor categories here. P, the planar algebra. Uh, uh, is the SO3 Q planar algebra uh, with D uh, Q squared plus 1 plus Q the negative 2. Okay, and with this lemma, these are all, all these implications are really simple. So the first implication, of course, is just the, uh, the lemma above. Uh, if the dimension of P4 is less than 3, then d4 is 0. Uh, well, then there's a relation amongst the elements of d4 is 0. So in particular, that determinant is 0. Uh, and then by the lemma, since they're not linearly dependent, they must spend. Okay. Then the second thing we look at, ah, we mistimed that. I just needed my <laughs> polynomial right there. Yeah, so the, the um, let me just rewrite it. Yeah, to do this, you really need a separate board of all of the interesting factors of all of these polynomials. They keep turning up. Okay, 
so what are the possibilities here going from, from 2 to 3? Well, we've, we've assumed away the possibility that d is equal to 0. So delta 4, 0 being 0 just says one of those other two factors is 0. One of them is what we want, so we just have to consider what happens if this other factor here is 0. d plus t plus dt there. So let's just think about that. d plus t plus dt equals 0. What do we do? We look at the condition that delta 4, 1, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's the determinant of some 5 by 5 matrix, which you can go and write down explicitly. Um, and it's also just some polynomial in d and t. Uh, and it's also got to be zero uh, because um, um, yeah, because we've already got this. Yep. Uh, and so you just solve that, and you find that in this with that pair of equations, d and t are a very special form. The golden ratio and its conjugate, a golden ratio and its conjugate. And very curiously, on that particular point, we're back in the first factor anyway. d plus t minus dt minus 2 equals 0 anyway. Hmm. OK. Uh, and finally, uh, 3 implies 4. Uh, so now, what have we got? Since d for 0 actually spans, and this n delta is, uh, is 0, Anything in the kernel of M40 is actually a relation in the, in the in the vector space. Okay, so we just look at the kernel. Of uh, M40. Let me just say that again for, for emphasis. Uh, if you just look at the kernel of M40 and find stuff that doesn't tell you it's a relation that, that your function satisfies. But if you look at the kernel of some matrix where the corresponding diagrams are already known to span for some reason, then uh, things in the kernel really are relations. And what you find is an instance of one of those relations we wrote up before. Um, and this is the famous relation that tells you you're looking at SO3 pretty much. Uh, exactly by the argument before, this relation suffices to evaluate all graphs. And so there's at most one function out there that uh, satisfies these conditions. Okay? Because using this relation, you can completely determine the function, and then you just say, well, the SO3 planar algebra has realized this function, and so there's at most, well, there's exactly one function satisfying all this, and it's SO3. And then finally, going back to the beginning, is it dimensions less than that? Okay, so that was all kind of a warm-up case. Uh, N equals 4 is not that excited, if not that exciting, um, but we need a little bit more about N equals 4. Uh, before we're ready to do the interesting stuff, where we start discovering more exciting examples. So let's just continue analyzing uh, four box space for a little while. So now we're going to push the dimension up a little bit. If the dimension is equal to four, we can prove various things. The cube must evaluate to some particular number. Um, and it's sort of pointless writing it out because the humans never actually do anything with this polynomial. Um, we should just call it like you know, f1 over f2, uh, some crazy formula. And moreover, there's some formula for the square. Well, it's maybe worth writing this one out. Something kind of exciting happens. Here. Uh, and uh, notice even before you start looking at the coefficients, something exciting has happened, which is that we're already in the uh, in the eigenspace where these are plus signs rather than minus signs. Or, or already we're, we're definitely in one of the two cases, uh, and moreover. Uh, d for zero is linearly independent. So that's basically uh, saying if we start with this, we kind of know everything that's going on about squares and the, and the four boundary point space. Okay, so how does this go? Well, of course, d for zero 
Is it basis? Good candidates. So those two things there, those two factors are definitely non-zero. Once you're in this case, you're allowed to divide by them if you want. And uh, at this point, I like to write down delta 4-1, uh, some crazy thing. But notice that in delta 4-1, there's the inner product of the, of the square with itself, which is the cube. So this, this, uh, this determinant isn't just a polynomial in D and T. It's, um, it's a polynomial in D and T and whatever the evaluation of the cube. Of course, the point is that this determinant now uh, must be zero because there are five things in there in this four dimensional space. Uh, this factor is definitely non zero from above. That factor is non zero, so you can just solve this to get the equation for the, for the cube. Uh, and it's sort of delightful that like, exactly the things you need to know in non zero will automatically come out from the, the previous determinants being non zero. And then finally, once you've got that, you substitute this particular value of the cube uh, into m41. Uh, the diagrams d41 definitely span, so we just look at the kernel of m41 and compute it, and it's exactly that relation. Oh. So everything is chugging along nicely. It's, it's maybe worth pointing out that thus far we still haven't gotten anything that Cooper Bird has. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, this is for, for the next 10 minutes, we're still doing stuff that Kuberberg said a long time ago. Okay, so from now on, or at least until further notice, let's always just assume that the, the hypothesis of that theorem holds. We're just going just to think about functions where uh, B4 ends up being four dimensional. Uh, but um, maybe at the end of this time, we'll break back out of that. Okay. So let's start looking at five boundary points. And we get the very similar uh, flavor of lemma. D50 is linearly independent. D5, or you get basically complete understanding of what's going on. There's a relation that says that you can simplify pentagon very explicitly. As a linear combination of 10 diagrams, this guy and its four other rotations, and this guy and its four other rotations, just by symmetry you know all those coefficients are the same for these guys and for these guys. You can write down what alpha and beta are explicitly in terms of uh, Anymore? <laughs> <laughs> What's the dimension of d 4 0 
to do 10 diagrams in V50, exactly these 10 diagrams here, and then this pentagon is the in, is the, uh, the D51. What happens to the temporary weak points? There's no temporary weak diagrams with five boundary points. Ah. So they suddenly <laughs> drop that out again. <laughs> really odd boundaries. But can we do two mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We can do this. We can do a single okay. phase. And so we know alpha and beta, but I don't think there's any point actually writing them down. Um, for now, so that we can also say, actually, the span of DNK, just for all NK now, this is actually the span, I have to introduce a little bit of new notation here. The problem with closing that door is it's now getting really, really hot. So this, so here I mean uh, diagrams without squares or pentagons. Depending on how far we get, we'll have some variations of this. Where if I write stuff up above the D, I mean, sort of forbidding those minors. So this is just saying, you write any diagram as a linear combination of ones that isn't there any squares or pentagons. I mean, this is just an obvious consequence of having this relation and having this relation back over here. Um, and in particular, as an easy consequence of this statement, B50 uh, spans B5. So we again get that dichotomy that D50 is linearly independent. So, 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 so the assumption ahead of time that we're assuming P4 is 4 in addition to. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so okay. let me please. So, um, so from now on, uh, assume P4 is 4. We always have this until I say otherwise, maybe at the end of the talk. So you're saying P50 is linearly independent of 4. In that first equation, you're not assuming that there's 10 diagrams on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm, I'm not a, yeah. Uh, but like in the, in the G2 example, they're linearly independent and that first thing, something of that form. Yes, yes, yes. So you can have linear independence and a relation of this form. Okay. Um, but the, this lemma doesn't talk about that. Also. If you're missing linear independence, then you're just still a relation. Uh, so yep. this is this thing you were talking about with equity. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is yeah. This is this is. It came up with. There is an example. Yeah, there is an example of this that we hadn't realized before. Um, we noticed it. Yeah. Okay, so let's just do this proof, uh, and it's very much like the proof of the lemma of the, the earlier lemma about linear independence of span. Um, the relation in D five zero. Looks like the sum from uh, i equals 0 to 4 of uh, zeta to the i, zeta here is a sum fifth root of unity, uh, times rho i, which is the rotation operator of x times this plus y times this for some values x. And this is just saying you can decompose the space of the relations as eigenvectors. And now if you take a relation of that form, um, then uh, let's assume that x is not 0 for a moment, and add an h on just here. Okay? In one of these terms, we haven't rotated at all, but here's a penny on Okay? And I can... Yeah. And all the other terms are somehow simpler, and you can actually check that all the other 10 terms here look like things over on the right-hand side. So you don't necessarily, out of this, get a relation that looks exactly like this, because there's no guarantee that all these coefficients are uniform, but you can then symmetrize, and you still get a relation of that form. In the case where x is 0, you have to do a little bit more work, um, and I think that actually what happens is that um, if there's a relation like this with x equals 0, maybe this wasn't even true or something, I forget, there's some little, little special case you have to handle when x is not 0. And so, uh, so that relation with the egg data on gave you exactly this sort of relation, and now all of these are easy consequences of having that relation. Okay, we can rewrite everything in terms of things that don't use squares or pentagons. And now why is this a, a consequence of this? Well, certainly P5 um, is just the span of D5 infinity, where we don't care about the number of, our, the number of faces. So that's just the same as the span of D 
the without squares and pentagons of five infinity, but um, there's nothing in in this d squared pentagon five infinity except the stuff that's in five zero. There's just no way of building diagrams with five boundary points that have no squares or pentagons, and so you get the final bit that you want. Okay. Um, unfortunately, this is this lemma is sort of the end of these um, funny kind of dichotomy lemmas that things are either linear or independent or span. And once you've got the six boundary points and so on, things start to fall apart and it becomes harder to, to, uh, to get things like that. But those two lemmas still get us a fair way. Uh, we're finally about to catch up with, with Greg and, um, and meet G2 falling out of this. And then we'll go a little bit further. Greg, if I remember right, Greg didn't know that it was an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have we have one example. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be a new example arriving at the same time as, as uh, well, arriving in this theorem right here. Uh, so d five zero is linearly independent, or so we're just kind of working out the consequences of, of those three conditions for a little while now. Uh, or we're in one of two cases. So this one that we discovered up at the data bay, t squared minus t minus one equals zero. And, uh, and our planar algebra is actually then uniquely determined. And it turns out it's this funny free product of one copy of temporary lead with loop value square root of dt inverse, just to be peculiar, uh, free producted with the even part of tlt. So what's going on here? Um, T here is a golden ratio. Uh, so, so TLT, this is just actually A4, or sort of the Galois conjugate version of it. And even part of it is just this two object category, the, the, the tadpole, or the, or the, uh, or the sort of Galois conjugate version of it. But you've got to be a little bit careful here. There's sort of a surprising thing. Uh, the, our string in, uh, in these graphs here gets interpreted over here as a kind of bizarre thing. Uh, it's actually, uh, let's call that factor blue and that factor red. It's a blue string, a red string, and then a blue string again. Not, not the usual sort of thing you do with three products in the subfactor of land, uh, but that's what you get. And the trivalent vertex you interpret as this sort of weird uh, protected trivalent vertex with three blue strings that just go around. In this red trivalent vertex, which is just a tadpole vertex in, in, in T2 in the middle. And then uh, you can work out lots about what this category looks like. You can write down bases and so on, calculate all the home spaces, etc. In, in particular, it's worth noting that the square root of dt inverse times t times the square root of dt inverse really is t. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, multiply the red and blue. And you get the right number again. That's a, a good sign. Okay, or, so we're either in this case, uh, or maybe let me just uh, say a little bit more about this because I'll sort of not say more about it later. Here, the dimension of the, well, dim uh, P by is actually eight. So not only do you have this relation simplifying the pentagon in terms of these 10 things, there's two further relations amongst these guys. So it's really, all the dimensions here are weird, uh, like uh, planar partition products of, or you get some weird exceptional case, <coughs> d equals t equals minus 1, and uh, the planar algebra is just actually g2 at a primitive temperature. Okay. So this, this theorem itself is not that exciting, but it's sort of the building block for the next one. So we calculate this determinant of diagrams with five boundary points, at most one internal face but no squares anywhere on the diagram, and you get something I've seen, that I'll spare you, and you write down delta 5, 0, which I won't spare you, um, because we actually need to look at its factors. We get e to the 10, t squared minus t minus 1 squared, dt minus t minus t plus 2, add to the fourth, and then uh, 2g t squared plus 2d t plus 3t squared plus 2. 
Now somehow, the thing you meant to be thinking is that these factors here, I'm not going to say this very well, but these initial factors are kind of really there. They're telling you about stuff that exists. And this is just some crap that kind of has to be there to account for some isolated points, some, some, some individual examples of, of categories that, that satisfy certain hypotheses. But somehow, like, the factor itself is just garbage. It, it's really just some polynomial that goes through a bunch of points, and it's not really the details of the, details of the polynomial that matter too much. OK, so we're not linearly independent. This polynomial is zero, so we just need to look at the cases of these factors being zero. Uh, it turns out, as soon as t is at this value, uh, you can uh, think about the relations that, that follow. Uh, because of the previous lemma, because we're not linearly independent, E50 actually expands. We're allowed to look at the kernel of M50 to identify relations. You see that those relations suffice to evaluate all closed diagrams. So there's at most one category sitting on this curve for each value t. And now you just exhibit a category that, set, that realizes each of the points on that curve. And so that's what gives you this weird, uh, this weird contrived example. Okay, uh, this factor here, we've actually already seen, uh, it's all, it's, it, it, as soon as that's zero, by some previous stuff we did, that has to be one of these SO3 categories, and it's not even in the, allowed in the current setup, because the dimension of P4 is 3, so it doesn't really deserve a mention in the state of the theorem. And then finally you get this crappy polynomial that doesn't really mean anything itself, what you do is you notice it's linear, linear in D. So you can just easily solve for D and then plug in that formula for D into this crazy polynomial, which also has to be zero. Okay, and you get some, some uh, uh, cubic in T. You look at its finite, not, not cubic, it's quite high. Degree, so you get some polynomial just in T. You solve that. You can recover D because you, D was linear in T. And you find in this case, uh, the pair DT is... Uh, Is just some finite set of possible values. Uh, sorry. Well, I can leave myself enough room. There's just one more. Uh, and it turns out that one of them, this minus one, minus one case, is this guy. One of them is back on this curve. Uh, this one has d equals zero. Uh, another one is back on this curve. And you basically just sort of see that you've already, you've already handled all the finitely many cases that come out of taking this and solving simultaneously with delta. 5, 1 being 0. OK, and now we're finally ready to give the, the best theorem about the 5-box space. And then we can move on to the 6-box space and start getting some really new things. So we just need to say now uh, everything that can possibly happen if uh, As long as the dimension of P5 is most 10, we can say exactly what happens. And what can happen is that we're a G2 category at some root of unity, or we're one of these. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, I need any ground, so. Uh, or, or we're one of these, these three guys. Okay. Uh, okay. And we're, we're nearly there. There's not that much to do, so what do we do? Otherwise, we need to consider the case where uh, d50 is linearly independent. So d50 is independent. Uh, then we have delta square 5, 1, which contains uh, 11 diagrams. That's 0. And so in particular, some horrendous polynomial, which I'll start writing down. And draw. If I read it all down, it would almost be on that line. Um, but there's some quite complicated polynomial. And it's a, it, this time it's not one of these crappy polynomials that, uh, that, that, that uh, is sort of arbitrary. Uh, everything on this curve is, is actually realized by something. So when you look at, um, uh, you look at uh, the kernel, of uh, M51. Uh, so notice here, because we're now in the case where 
these 10 diagrams are linearly independent, uh, they're actually a basis, according to in this case, that we've assumed the dimension is small enough. So we can actually look at the kind of to get relations and, uh, and find uh, one of these great relations that are useful by penny points. Okay. And as soon as you have a relation like that, you know that you can evaluate all closed graphs. So there is at most one function satisfying all these hypotheses. So we just have to exhibit one to see it. And uh, G2 with uh, particular values of Q, which you can get from uh, this formula. Although, actually, Greg, Greg did a horrible thing when he wrote about this stuff long ago, which was that he used the square root of the Q that everyone in the world was meant to be using. Um, so, yeah, this isn't quite the Q that. Things in books. It's not here in his relation. Um, yeah, in one of the two papers. But not the second paper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so G2 with this value of D uh, realizes such a function. So but this the, the essence was that this relation gave us uniqueness, and so uh, that gives us the gift. But with this step, I mean, like, the computer can't do that. Can't do what? Well, like you can imagine, I mean, you can use that to see that you have some relation between D and T, and on the other hand, you have this formula for D as some function of Q and T as some function of Q. That step is still just sort of using yeah, so here, outside knowledge and not. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, the, the computer is not telling us that um, if you take the particular D and T coming from G2, that that's actually parameterizing this curve. Uh, you, you've got to go and that human's got to go and think about that. And I guess that it's just some statement that like this algebraic curve is rational and that's a parameterization of it. But yeah, but yeah, there's, there's a human has to come in for a moment. Uh, there. Okay, I'm uh, nearly there. You can probably open the book. Yes, it's <laughs> a fantastic idea. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so um, I sort of want to say that after this, it's just a chase scene. Um, we, we really just at this point kind of repeat the same ideas over and over again, getting the computer to calculate a few more determinants for us. Um, but finally, some surprising stuff starts turning up. Um, so let's just go to, to uh, six memory points. So either d square zero is a independent. Yeah. Have the width of p four equals four. Yeah, we still have that. All three. Yep. And dim p five is it not there? Or not? Um. Mm, no, we're yeah. So yeah, the, the, when when we're not assuming that, that this this holds in what follows, we're, we're still just in in the case that didn't P four is four, but we're and we're ignoring what basically what we know about the five box space and being independent of that six box space now. Okay, so if they're linearly independent, it's just worth noting here that this dimension P six has been at least thirty four, uh, just because there are thirty four diagrams in there. Either it's linearly independent, or it's boring. It's this uh, free product guy, or it's a G two Q at a uh, fourth, tenth, or eighteenth root of unity. Uh, so there's one new idea in the proof. It's a sort of well, rather one new computational trick. So you look at uh, the irreducible factors of uh, this determinant for the, the six zero diagrams. And now, one of these factors uh, is sort of a, an honest factor that corresponds to this whole, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. None of the factors here are honest factors. They're all just garbage. 
Mm, and uh, looking at the fact at the individual factors, this guy doesn't tell you anything at all. And uh, well, uh, sorry. One factor is this one, t squared minus t minus one. But then there's just some horrible thing that this happens to be a single point on, or, or some finitely many points on. So what do you do when faced with that gigantic, disgusting factor? Uh, what you do is you can compute uh, uh, a Grobner basis for, uh, for each factor along with uh, delta square of 6, 1 and delta square 6, 2, which are even more obscene polynomials. But the point is just that if we find some relation amongst these guys, then it's going to cause all of these determinants to vanish simultaneously, okay? Uh, and what basically what this does is it enables us to identify the finitely many points on the various factors of this polynomial that are, that are actually of interest. Uh, and that, so computing this Grobner basis, uh, it turns out it gives you something very nice. You get a, a polynomial that's just a polynomial in D, and then another polynomial that's linear in T and, and a pi order in D, and then a bunch more polynomials. But using the first two, obviously, you get you see that you have the most finitely many solutions. Use the higher the other polynomials to cut some of those down. You also look at uh, delta seven zero. Uh, you don't actually need to compute this polynomial. You just need to check various of these finitely many points substituted into here and calculate the determinant of particular values. You rule out a few more special cases. But we're not, this is really work for a computer, um, where we're just uh, trying to get rid of a bunch of kind of uh, stupid intersection points of these polynomials uh, that, that don't actually correspond to categories. And so we just do the kind of the algebra, uh, and, and you get this sorry, result. Is, the, yeah, sorry. So I got the most name. You had the, the, uh, how did the, how did 6 1 come into the X? So if you have a relation amongst diagrams in here, then not only does it cause this determinant to be zero, it causes this determinant, this determinant, and this determinant to be zero. Why is that? Well, because these diagrams here are just a superset of those diagrams. So if there's a linear relation amongst these diagrams, there's a linear relation amongst these. So 6, 1 means? At most one internal relation. face. So for example, there's a hexagon, there's a pentagon with a fork on it, and there's, and there's six different places. So it's not, it's, it's not exactly one, it's less than one. Yeah. yeah, less than one. Yeah. So these are always yeah, including up now this space, D60, doesn't quite include D70, the different number of boundary points. You can just put a fork somewhere on the boundary. If there's a relation here, there has to be a relation here. Anyways. And so this trick of solving them simultaneously is just a trick to, to find the interesting particular points on these curves that correspond to the factors. Uh, and so what falls out of all of that algebra is just these weird cases where the dimensions, where at these particular groups of unity, there are, there are relations. Okay. That's not particularly interesting, but let's go to the next one, and the next one suddenly algorithms. Um, well, loosely speaking, algorithms. I'll show you what exactly it is. So we just sort of keep following our nose and prove the next theorem along these lines. So either d e squared 6, 1. Dependent. Uh, so in that case, d six is at least uh, forty one, uh, or you get a bunch of things. Um, you get this p product guy that's always there, or you get d two q some root of unity. You get eleven groups of unity are now allowed as well. Uh, or um, some weird polynomial vanishes that at the moment we understand absolutely nothing about. It's quite large. Or uh, d squared minus 3d minus 1 equals 0, which is of course just saying that v is plus or minus square root 13 over 2. Tilt. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly you get excited when you see that drop out of stuff. And t is some specific value in terms of that d. Or one of 
finite being and other exceptions uh, that are almost certainly rubbish. I mean, they're really, really silly. They're things like deep satisfies some degree 16 polynomial with 10 digit coefficients, and t is some number that can rise a polynomial in d with like 50 digit coefficients. They're, they're clearly nonsense, but they're just they're just finitely many points that fall out of this regular basis nonsense. And at the moment, I mean, the computer is actually running, doing little calculations to like, substitute these finitely many exceptions into higher than. Good set. I don't get any claps. So, uh, yeah, so the computer is running at the moment to try and take some of these finitely many exceptions and substitute them into higher and higher determinants, which the computer can go and calculate very slowly to try and get rid of them. Because you know that the things that are nonsense will eventually uh, uh, result in some big determinant not being zero. But it's sort of, we're, we're at the point now where, where computer time is, um, where we're getting to the limit of available computer time. Okay. So this isn't a particularly exciting theorem. It says lots and lots of different things can happen. But uh, this is kind of exciting. So uh, let's see what we can say about that one and see what its relation with hard work is. And it turns out that we can actually, we can actually um, show that the function at those, point, at those values of dmt, and moreover, sort of without any effort, just doing dimension counting, we can show that it's related to hard work. So here we go. Uh, there's uh, most one, Function with uh, d equals 3 plus or minus square root of 13 over 2, and d equals whatever that number was over there. Um, uh, but we needed, a, at the moment, I need a hypothesis on this theorem assuming that d square 6, 2 spans d6. I strongly suspect that you can remove this, but I'm not exactly sure. But if you add this hypothesis in, then the proof is, is easy. So what do you do? Well, since we've got this spanning condition, we're allowed to look at the kernel of the corresponding matrix. What do we find? Well, we find relations. Let's say you can take a pair of pentagons glued together. So there in that space, six boundary points, most two faces, no internal squares. And we find a relation that says that guy is actually in the span of uh, diagrams with most one internal face. And we find another relation that says that the hexagon is in the span of diagrams uh, with no internal faces. Okay. Now this is really, really lovely because there's a, 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 an easy result in, uh, in graph theory that just says that every planar trivalent graph has uh, um, uh, an <coughs> thing on with n at most four or two adjacent pentagons, or a pentagon adjacent to x. And now, since I've, I've already probably gone over time, maybe I won't say the proof again, but we talked about this at Bodega Bay. This is this method of discharging. This is kind of the canonical example of proving something using the method of discharging. Um, and Nora and I, for quite a long time now, have been wanting an application of this particular Nora and discharging to tensor categories and so on. And particularly you talked about it a year ago. Yes, we've been talking about it for a while. Yeah, I mean, we, we were trying to think about the, the, the 5 minus epsilon color theorem using this lemma as well. Um, but finally, we've actually found a use for this particular lemma in graph theory back in tensor categories, because, well, an immediate corollary of this, uh, of this little lemma is that every planar trigon graph either has an n-gon with n greater than 4, a pair of pentagons, or just a hexagon. 
Um, maybe there's an easy, even easier proof of that fact. It doesn't go through this one. Uh, but in particular, this gives us uniqueness, okay? Because we can reduce these guys into things with even fewer faces, and so running downhill, you can evaluate everything. So there's at most one. Now, what is it? So it's not hardware. It can't work. Well, so it's not the even part of hardware. It can't be the even part of hardware, even though uh, in the even part of hardware, um, there's what looks like a trivalent vertex. Well, there is a trivalent vertex. You've got this guy x here. And you look in, say, x squared. There's another copy of x. That's a trivalent vertex. It's got the right dimension. You might think you're all set. But of course, this uh, this um, this thing here is the even part of the, the um, uh, of the uh, of the hardware planar algebra, and this object x here is, is the second Jones Menzel atom component here. So the category that just this x and its trivalent vertex generates is just an SO3 category. It's completely foreign. Okay. So crash. <laughs> Where's hardware going to come in? Well, there are other things related to hardware, and the thing that uh, Noah and Pinhas famously discovered not so long ago is that as well as these two categories coming from the two even parts of Hagra, there's a third category in the Maruto equivalence class of those two guys. So, uh, uh, Pinhas discovered H3, the fusion category, uh, the same uh, fusion ring, as the even part of hardware. Okay? So this, this graph here, this principal graph telling you some of the tensor product rules is still correct for H3, but there's a different underlying category. And uh, what do we... Ah, okay. So uh, the thing that you've got to go and check, which I guess I haven't done, uh, is that uh, dim p4 equals 4 using that trivalent vertex. Okay, but you take this trivalent vertex that you know is a trivalent vertex because the fusion ring is the same, you go check the span of this four diagrams. Back here it was three dimensional, so you've got to go and check its four dimensions. Then, I mean, if it, if it were three dimensional, you could use the first theorem you proved and say yes. that it was the even part yeah. of a super transitive subfactor and it just isn't. Yep. Well, yep. Then it would be high graph. High graph's unique. Okay, so we know that whatever this thing, this weird thing here is, is a cubic category. Uh, sorry, that's what in the paper we're writing we call it. Is one of these functions that's multiplicative in the right ways, and dimp four is four. But in order to see that it's actually this guy, we need a little bit more work because we had this, this assumption here, and we've got to work out how on earth could we verify this. And it turns out just a little bit of dimension counting and just one final determinant will get us there. So the trick is that you can calculate uh, in uh, P6 uh, for H3, and you can calculate it very easily because you already know it for hard group, and the fusion ring is the same, and it's 37. Okay? I mean, all that you do is just compute x tensor cube here and count the sum of the squares of the multiplicities of, of symbols, and you get 37. Okay, so what do we do? Well, step one is that. Uh, D60 is linearly independent uh, for H3 because we had a complete classification of the of the of the non-linearly independent cases for D60, and it was all this weird G2 junk. In particular, this value of D wasn't allowed there. So those guys are linearly independent. You count for 34. So all that we need to do is find three more things in this P6 space that, is, that are linearly dependent with those guys, and um, so, so if we can find uh, 37 elements of D61, which are linearly independent, Uh, we're done. Okay, because 
is 37 of them, they're independent, they're actually a basis. And so D61 spans not only D62. Okay? So all that we do is calculate the determinant. Thankfully, the computer does it for us. Uh, I'm trying to prove that this unique, this at most one thing, yes. satisfying all of this, is actually realized by H3. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I mean, so yeah. yeah, at the moment, we just knew that there was. Um, so, you're using facts about H3 that. I'm using two things. I'm using that DIMP4 is 4, mm. which is. Um, which you don't check. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm using. Oh. Sorry, just a second. Now, now I'm actually worried about this. This, this. this board here I thought up last night on the plane, so it's probably actually rubbish. <laughs> um, do, you, do we actually know that's true? Like we know the six box that is. Oh, you're worried about. But I'm worried about generating. Is, is it actually generated? Is it actually generated by things that drive on the vertex? Uh, like this is just the span of things made by. Yeah, I mean, I would, maybe there's a hole. I would, I would have to think about. I'm, okay. I'm sure there's not a serious hole. Okay. I mean, because if, if it didn't generate that, it would have to generate something smaller, and there, I, like, there's just not room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we calculate the matrix of the inner products. Of the stuff in D6, uh, 0, which is we expect already in the independent, along with three things. And what are they going to be? They're going to be uh, a pentagon with a fork. And notice there are, so there are six different pentagons with a fork. But since the dimension is only 37 here, and this really counts for 34, we expect these six things to actually have three relations amongst them. So we just take any three of them. So I'll just take some three adjacent rotations of it, of it and draw it in such a way that you can't tell how much you're rotated by. But that's just three out of the six rotations. Calculate this determinant. It's some explicit polynomial in DNT. Substitute in these numbers and get something non-zero. And so those guys will be in the end. And so D61 span. And so H3 satisfies this theorem and, and, and believes this thing. Wait, uh, no, for that you need to know that the T for H3 really is the right T. Um, or is that I, forced by B being the right? I Maybe think you. I think you don't. Right yeah, I, I think oh, the, the previous theorem. Yeah, identifies. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in particular, we have uh, an explicit set of relations for H three, a uh, set of generators and relations for H three here um, that are that are the nicest possible sort. They sort of they let you evaluate everything downhill by simplifying that. So what are the problems? Yeah. Okay, yes. You were traveling on the plane with two kids. Yeah. They, Did you possibly think of anything? <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they, they were riding cheerful from uh, Minneapolis to Seattle, and they slept from Seattle to Canada. Did you assign some of the terms to sign? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, we're sort of like, still going here. Obviously, the computer can look at seven box spaces. You can also relax dim p4 equals 4 and look at dim p4 equals 5 and 6, where you expect to see Deline's exceptional series and Virgil's weird plane, and maybe you can hope to just use these sort of dumb arguments to discover relations uh, amongst well, well, can you use these dumb things to get existence? Well, yeah, so notice what we did here is we used the fact that Noah and Pinas had already made this right. H3. And so you, you should be able to do existence very easily in this particular case. Because we've got a set of downhill relations, yeah. all you need to do is check a confluence. So you've got to look at so you've got these two relations, but you've got to also remember you've got a relation simplifying a square and then so the other simple relations. And all that you have to do is look at each overlap of a pair of these two diagrams. Look at the two ways of simplifying that diagram using the two different relations, and then showing that you can use the available relations again to sort of reunite those two simplifications is the same thing. And if you can check that, then, then it's consistent. And it's a finite amount of work, but it's not a finite amount of work that you can do by seeing that some determinant is zero or not zero, so it hasn't been done. You wouldn't get positivity from No. OK. Positivity, you probably would. You could look at some Bradley diagram and trace 
First thing to do is replace it in a product way. Yeah, so the thing was it's moving. Okay, we're done. Thanks. So is this a machine that you can use? Is that what um, you were saying when you were thinking about the lean inverter? Yeah, so um, the determinants remain pretty easy to do. I mean, you can enumerate all the diagrams in D, N, K with arbitrary forbidden lines and so on. You can calculate its determinants. Mm. The determinants, once you go past this regime here, start, start having entries which are certain complicated polyhedra. Uh, but the, the really difficult part in all of this was this Grobner basis stuff. When you get these stupid factors in the determinants where you really expect there's just finally many points sitting on there, and you need to compute some Grobner basis. I mean, you just so find the simultaneous solutions of some really horrible polynomials, and that's where the computer is going to give up on us. And we, we won't be able to take these rubbish factors and, and split off the, 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 the individual points that really correspond to patterns. That's where we're going to fail. And and that scales really, really badly. Like as 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 multivariable polynomials get more variables and more degrees, the Grobner basis algorithm is a disaster very quickly. Um, you so we got a little bit. Um, uh, in the direction of so for the sort of the, the dim p four equals six, you can do this sort of analysis and, and discover that there are kind of two possible classes of relations. There's uh, like square two squares plus or minus two squares the other way equals a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and there's these two cases. The Vogel plane is the anti is the minus sign one. The other one we have no examples of. We don't know if there's anything there or not. But it's, it suggests a whole new thing to, to go look at. Um, so that's. Uh, and that's and when you say the Vogel plane, you mean the quantized version? And, and even the quantum version, yes. Yeah, so it would be this four parameter crazy. Well, yeah. Three, really three parameters. So that, that's in that case. And then if you look at dim P4 equals five, you just get a relation uh, that either of these you can simplify in terms of simple stuff. And there's a little bit of more work that the computer did uh, a day or two ago is that you can simplify this guy in terms of simple stuff. Um, and it's pretty likely that the computer will find one or two more relations here. Um, for example, I expect that it will um, get all the next ones, maybe like three pentagons stuck together in vertex or something like that. But you're still pretty far from where you want to be because. Um, even sort of with one or two more relations that you expect you're going to derive here, you can't evaluate closed diagrams. And so you haven't proved any because you've still got potentially potentially huge kinds of things sitting out there. This dim P4 is 5 is supposed to be the quantum exceptional family. Yeah, so all the exceptional groups, the quantum versions and a uh, one parameter family of things interpolating between them all. No sign of root 17. Uh, no, yeah, no, no root 17s yet. Yeah. <laughs>